Uh, our speaker today, David Sutherland, is an attorney, lives in the uh, Indianapolis area. He's a native of Chicago and by birth, I grew up in Northwest Indiana. His dad worked for the, the mills. And, he worked in the mills. For the That's longest right. time, we had plenty of conversation between uh, here in Milwaukee yesterday. Uh, he is a three-time president of the Indianapolis uh, Civil War Roundtable. And he is a 1973 graduate of BMI, an Army veteran, served in Korea, and he is going to talk to us about uh, BMI and its Civil War connections, and a whole lot more. So, I give you the David Sutherland. Thank you, Jim. Before I get started, I let me show you some uniforms I brought in, and if, if after tonight's presentation, please feel free to come over here and take a look at them. Um, this is a coat, <clears throat> this is an overcoat the cadets wear at VMI, uh, obviously the wintertime thing. This is, it's got a red cape on it, which is a bit different from the coats you'll see at the uh, at West Point at the U.S. Service Academy, U.S. Military Academy, but it's a very similar in style to uh, uh, the winter coat that they wear at West Point. This is a uniform <clears throat> that they call a blouse. Uh, and again, I, I wore this uniform when I was up visiting West Point when I was a VMI cadet. And one of the West Point plebes who was calling the numbers about for breakfast formation, some a formation, he was calling them out. And I asked him, like, where are we forming up? Are we going, where's Grand Hall or something for the formation? It was early in the morning. He didn't see, there's some modest distinctions between this one and a West Point uniform. And he looked at me like, uh, as an upperclassman, sir, what are you bothering me for? You know where Grant Hall is. He's been here for three years. You should know. But um, this, this is a uniform that they wear. They've been wearing this uniform since the uh, late 19th century. This is the uniform they wear for dinner formations, uh, supper formations. Um, but it's a common uniform they wear at VMI. Uh, and they and have worn since shortly after the Civil War. This is a uniform that has changed a bit since the Civil War time. But it has 42 buttons on it. At the Civil War era, uh, at the top, they were wider apart, at the bottom, than at the waist, they were narrower. But even as 1842, you will see this type of uniform that was worn by the cadets at VMI for ceremonies. The um, buttons on this have the crest of Virginia, and it's with the motto, Six Semper Tyrannus, for each of the buttons. And if you check the uh, cuffs of these coats, of this coat, no, it must be the other one. You'll ha they have a VMI uh, cufflink in them, but one of them has a West Point cufflink because when you visit the other academies, you would exchange cufflinks sometimes to denote your visits there. And so the same thing for the West Point folks will have a, no, this is one. This is a West Point cufflink here. So you'll see those exchanged. The cadets would exchange those during their visits. This is a raincoat uh, that the cadets wear. And the material in it, when you feel it, you see the coat that Jackson wore at the Battle of Chancellorsville, the fabric, the material. It's very similar to what this one uh, is. Uh, very thick, um, but this is a standard raincoat they wear at VMI. It's like oiled canvas. Yeah, that's, it's not rubber, it's oiled canvas, right? Yeah, that's what it is. Well, maybe it is rubber. Make sure you wash your hands now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but feel free to come up and take a yeah, look at these uniforms. Oily. No, it's not oily. No, yeah, it's no sleeve. No sleeves. You, you can stick your arms out, but you just kind of walk inside of it like a cape. On the other side, over there on the table, you'll see a four-volume history of VMI. That is a volume. Those four volumes were written by Colonel William Cooper, who was VMI class of 1904, and I brought them along because. Uh, for the first hundred years of VMI's history, Colonel Cooper devotes a paragraph in those books to the Mexican-American War, 1840s. He devotes a page to the Spanish-American War, 1898. The Great War, World War I, he has an entire chapter. But the Civil War and those four volumes take a, a volume and a half. So if you think about it, a volume and a half for four years, 96 years, gets two and a half volumes. So in his mind, 81 years ago, he saw the Civil War as having an enormous impact on VMI back in 1939. I will submit to you tonight that even with the additional 81 years, all the folks who've served in VMI in World War II, uh, Korea, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, it's still VM the Civil War has had more impact on VMI than any other conflict. And that's what I'll share with you tonight. And I'd like to share it with you in three ways. Uh, I'll share with you um, some of the 
um, some of the tangible evidence of VMI that you'll see. And I also like to share the, the crux of this presentation is about four vignettes dealing with 20th century military folks from VMI and what I see as echoes of the Civil War and what they did in their careers. Uh, to begin with, I'll take you back to VMI just a, a bit to look at it when it's been more contemporary times. Then I'll go back and look at it in Civil War and set the stage for looking at the Civil War legacy. And that's what I wish to share with you tonight. Now, Alec and I are going to coordinate this. I haven't rehearsed this with Alec, but this will be, I'm going to give my head nods to him. I don't have a clicker. So we'll work on this thing. We'll work on this thing. I've known you only since you were like this size. So work this thing out. See how it works for us. And I'll let you change the slide, Alec. Thank you. During my first weeks at VMI, I was amazed by the number of visitors that you would see at the Institute. And I'm not talking just about the visitors who would have come to a traditional college or university, the prospective students and the parents, but I was amazed at the number of school buses that you would see with the little kids, the yellow school buses, the tour buses, the RVs of folks who were coming to visit the place. On the southeast corner of the VMI parade ground and the northwest corner of the VMI parade ground are two museums associated with VMI. 90 miles down the Shenandoah Valley is a third museum associated with VMI. And that third museum sits on a battlefield that VMI operates. Most American colleges and universities don't have museums associated with them. And if they do, they seldom would have three. And if they have, would have three, I can't imagine other schools having their museum where they have a, a battlefield on it that, they're connect, that their entire student body fought on as a military unit in the Civil War. VMI has that. It's not better or worse. It's just different from a traditional college or university. Uh, now can I ask you to back up, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, the cadets live here in a National Historic Landmark. Uh, VMI last year celebrated its 180th birthday. Uh, the Institute is the nation's second oldest public military college. It is the nation's, uh, it is also Virginia's second oldest public college after uh, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. The concept for VMI was that of a normal school. It was to graduate teachers and engineers who would then go out in Virginia and uh, obviously become school teachers, but work on the railroads, the canals, um, the roadways, as opposed to the University of Virginia where you received more of a classical education. VMI cadets would re well receive cl classes in the humanities, but the idea was to have it more as a, uh, as, as a normal school. Um, and the cadets, the cadets here at VMI uh, are set up to be not professional soldiers like the service academies. They're set up to be trained here as citizen soldiers. But the color and the pageantry at VMI makes it a very different place from most colleges. You see here the, what are called garrison flags flying in front of the barracks. Go ahead, Alec. This is a garrison flag. Uh, if you haven't folded a garrison flag before, this is not something you fold easily by yourself. <laughs> you, you, you need a, a group of folks to fold this. And what you do at VMI, the first day the uh, cadet arrives, they arrive and they're processed into a squad, into a platoon, into a company, a battalion. And for the next four years, that's their home. And they're going to train and do events together. They'll rappel together. They're going to do obstacle courses. Uh, but they have to learn to do things together. Uh, they can't operate well on their own. Life at VMI is quite different from the life at a traditional college or university. All the students at VMI are enrolled in the Cadet Corps. Uh, they'll form up for breakfast, uh, for dinner, for supper formations. They have inspections, parades, they change uh, guard, they have a guard mount. They'll have bugles blow during the day. <clears throat> and when those bugles blow, the Cadet has to be in the right place at the right time and in the right uniform. Uh, and that's a challenge for the first year cadet of VMI. Uh, the Institute refers to the grounds at VMI as a military post. They don't refer to it in VMI vernacular as a campus. Uh, there is, they don't have a chancellor or a president like you would at most colleges and universities. They have a superintendent. They do not have a provost. They have a commandant. And the commandant over, oversees the discipline of the Corps of Cadets. Classes are small. It's about 11 or 1 to 12 to 1 cadet to faculty ratio. The academics are rigorous. VMI has produced about a dozen Rhodes Scholars. It's also produced service chiefs for three of the nation's armed services. 
Uh, the Institute's graduated, has had graduates serve uh, up to over 270 general or admiral positions and produced thousands of colonels and captains for, for, their armed, our, for our armed forces. The cadet uniform is a Charlottesville gray. You'll see here the cadets are wearing shakos. Um, the, uh, and the officers have plumes on top of those shakos. On the front of the shako is the crest of Virginia. Uh, and these officers are also wearing a sash and a saber. Uh, and, and this is a parade uniform of the Institute. If you haven't visited the Shenandoah Valley uh, before, I recommend you visit it. And if you could choose a time to visit VMI, the springtime is, in my opinion, one of the best times to go. When you get later in the summer, it gets to be very warm there. The springtime in the Shenandoah Valley is just absolutely gorgeous. In the afternoons, the Institute has, uh, the barracks have a mustard colored hue to them. And in the early morning, there's a mist that envelops the Shenandoah Valley. And when you look at through, the, through the mist and over to the mountains, you'll see that's a blue haze. And with that blue haze, that's where the mountains get the name the Blue Ridge. When the haze clears, this is looking west from VMI's parade ground, looking across to House Mountain and the Alleghenies. If, and if you look behind VMI to the Blue Ridge, this is the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, once the haze is cleared. The barracks at VMI are quite tall. Uh, they're far taller than they look from the opposite side of the parade ground. Uh, Alexander Jackson Davis was a New York architect who designed VMI. It's designed to look like an English castle. Um, and it's, it's, it's an impressive place to be in, in, in and live inside this place. Here's a picture of the cadets formed outside for a supper formation. Uh, you can see the uh, courtyard inside the barracks. Um, a, a, a bit of a view here. The cadets room at VMI so that the new cadets live on the top floor. And as you advance in rank in seniority with your class, you move down a level. So that when you're a senior or first class cadet, you're living on the ground floor, so you don't have to walk up and down the stairs. So one of the advantages of moving up in, in seniority in the cadet corps. These barracks house the entire VMI cadet barracks. Uh, there are three interconnected barracks. The barracks are connected by what's called a sally port. You can walk among the barracks uh, to to move from one to the other. The oldest is on the right, the newest barracks is on the left. And this is another view of the barracks. Uh, you can see inside there, each cadet room opens up onto a stoop, so there's no hallway. Uh, once you step outside your room in the morning or the evening, you step outside into the temperature, not necessarily the elements because you do have something over your head, but you'll see what the temperature is when you go outside. The barracks have some depth to them as you can see in this, this photograph. And this is the, uh, these are the delightful, gorgeous rooms that cadets have to live in at, at VMI. Um, note that the uniforms are hung in order. There's a book of regulations that prescribes how you hang your clothes in your closet. The VMI closet is a pole. It goes just across from one side of wood to the other. Uh, you'll note that the footgear is then down below, placed below the uniforms. There are no civilian clothes. Uh, the cadets wear cadet uniforms 24-7 from the time they arrive there. When they arrive, they're going to lose most of their hair. Uh, they'll take their civilian clothes, they pack them away. Uh, they'll get them when they go home. If you'll notice, the books are arranged in order too. They have a height, height order for them. So everything is arranged. There are orders for everything. Uh, the dresser you have at VMI, those are shelves. And you have to fold your clothes a certain way and put them on the shelf. The socks, the underwear, the towels, everything has to be folded and placed in a certain way. And the rooms are inspected daily. It's just like college life, Alec, that you're familiar with. No, okay. It's not like that at Loyola? Okay, well. I'll take, a, take your word for it there. You missed a lot. Um, <clears throat> this is a hay at VMI. The cadets don't have beds in the room. Um, they have uh, a, a cot they sleep on. They refer to their cot as a hay. And you'll see that one of the hays there is, is up against the wall. In the morning, they have to roll their mattresses up. They stack them in the corner of the room, and they stack all their hays up so they can walk around the room. The rooms are rather modest in size. I like to think of um, the VMI barracks to me when I saw them when I was reporting. Uh, my mother looked at me and said, you don't have to go here. You can go to Indiana University. You don't have to go to this place. It looks more like Joliet or Michigan City, when you see it, than it probably does for a college. Yeah, there's a better way. Uh, there, there are some advantages with VMI. There are not a lot to being a cadet there. But one of them is uh, the laundry. You put your laundry in the bag there in the room, and then the laundry is sent out each week. So you, throw your, you toss out your laundry. You pick it back up from the laundry. They do your laundry for you. Uh, so you never have to wash any clothes for four years. So the cadet's not going to know any more about washing laundry 
when they graduate from VMI than when they start. See, the education is not nearly as good as Loyola, is it? You get all that. <coughs> uh, each of the cadet rooms have rifles in them. Um, uh, they don't have firing guns. So if you really get ticked off with your roommate, you know, you, you can hit your roommate with your books or anything you want to, but, but you can't shoot the roommate because you don't have a firing pin for your, for your rifle. Um, these are, uh, this is, this is where you place your cup and your shaving gear and the like. Um, I never knew that you, there was such a thing as a proper way to roll a toothpaste tube until I went to VMI. Uh, I was placed on report for an improperly rolled toothpaste tube one time, and, and I don't do it anymore. I mean, that's uh, something I've learned to overcome. Uh, in addition to uh, keeping the rooms clean, the cadets will have to master the rudiments of drill. And they begin that in their early days at VMI. They have to learn how to march, uh, how to salute, how to form up, what not to do when you're forming up, and you've got to learn to do it on command. I particularly like this slide because it shows everybody kind of doing something together except for one poor person who doesn't know their left from their right. And, and it happens all the time, but it's the sort of thing at VMI, you don't want to stand out that first year. You want to blend in. You, so spiked hair, green hair, anything to call attention to yourself, you don't want to do that. If you do call attention to yourself, you'll get some concise, clear direction. <laughs> they, they usually provide it for you so it's easily understood. And if you have any trouble understanding it, uh, they do some team counseling. This is this will help you learn to understand um, what you need and what you did wrong and to take it the right way. If team counseling doesn't work on an indiv individual, they will do group counseling. <clears throat> and this is group counseling so that everybody learns to get it together right. Um, and if this doesn't work, they also have mass counseling. Mass counseling takes place uh, in the evenings, uh, late, it sometimes place, takes place early in the mornings. The nice thing about mass counseling for the new cadet, it only happens during Hell Week. Now, the bad news of VMI is Hell Week is seven months long. <laughs> okay. uh, the mess hall. <clears throat> this, like life in the barracks, has a routine of its own. Uh, the mess hall is a place that has a routine of its own. The new cadets dine separately from the upper class cadets. And I particularly like this slide because the New Cadet is looking at a book they call the Rat Bible. The Rat Bible has all the trivia a New Cadet has to memorize at VMI. Or not all of it, but it contains a good deal of it. <clears throat> and the Cadet has to master that in a short amount of time. Um, if they don't master it, then you go back to group counseling again. Uh, I especially, uh, go back Alec, please. I like the look of the one Cadet with the funny look on his face sitting at the table between the two Cadets who are standing. He's got that look like, I really should have listened to mom and dad and gone someplace else. I didn't have to go here, but it's a little late now, okay. Uh, this is an event they have some, or they used to have when they sat in uh, family style for dinner. If they had an extra piece of uh, chicken or an extra dessert, this is how they determined who would get the extra piece of chicken or dessert. They would have something like um, rock, paper, scissors, and that's the way they allocate who would get the extra food. So you got, everybody got fed the same, but if there was a little bit extra, this is how you divvied it up. But the mess has a very interesting routine. Uh, this is a slide, in addition to the life of the barracks and the mess hall and all, you also have to do the military training side. Uh, and that'll keep you busy if, you, if you're not busy in class, if you're not busy with everything else, this will help you sleep well at night too. Um, the cadets will decide among themselves with the services which armed force they want to train in. Um, they will choose either Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine Corps. If they have no preference for it, uh, no preference, they will train in U.S. Army. And each cadet becomes a member of a company. And then almost every four years, uh, the cadets will report, will, re will take a trip to Washington, and on the 20th of January, they'll participate in an inaugural parade. And they've done this most every four years uh, since William Howard Taft's uh, inaugural 1908. When they graduate, uh, most VMI cadets uh, will be, take a commission in the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, and commissioning, although not required, is very highly recommended. And once they graduate, then they'll get to join some really big teams. What we're going to do tonight uh, is something you could do with other wars and other battles. Uh, for example, you could do the Battle of the Bulge with VMI alumni in it, but tonight we're going to look at VMI in the American Civil War. To set, set the stage for going back to 1860, um, this is a lithograph of the Virginia Military Institute in 1857. You can see there uh, the barracks at VMI in the, in the middle upper right of the, of, the, of the slide. You can see some cadets who are standing in front of the barracks. Uh, there are some cadet officers who are standing um, 
Below the, cadets, below the cadets who are formed up, uh, you'll see a statue of George Washington there. To the right, excuse me, to the, to the left of the barracks, uh, you'll see a small parade ground. The parade ground is still there at VMI, but it's much, much larger today than it was at the time of the Civil War. You'll also see some faculty houses there, um, two faculty houses to the left of the barracks. Those are still there too, but they're moved farther today than they were at the, civil, at the time of the Civil War. They moved them off that, that slide. Uh, to the right of, VM, of the barracks, you'll see the mess hall, a uh, good part, halfway down that hill. And then you'll see a carriage uh, going uh, on, the, on the road there. That road is now U.S. Highway 11. And that carriage is heading, uh, you would go east and then uh, north and through the Shenandoah Valley. But uh, uh, that, that photo, this lithograph would be painted from a position about uh, just to the south of the current football stadium at VMI. The building you see between the two masonry buildings, though, that's the old VMI hospital. That was there in 1848. And this is the Commandant's home at VMI. It was destroyed during the Civil War, rebuilt afterwards, and it was moved from where you saw it in that lithograph in 1857. And this is the superintendent's quarters at VMI. This is one of the um, buildings that survived, two buildings that survived the Civil War. It survived because the superintendent's uh, daughter was with child, and uh, General David Hunter, when he um, took possession of the Institute in June of 1864. Uh, he made his headquarters in the house, but he did not burn the quarters because uh, um, the, the, his daughter, the superintendent's daughter being with child. In addition to those, those residences on the post at VMI, in town is the home of Stonewall Jackson, and VMI operates that today. On the far left, you'll see a statue of George Washington, and behind it, you'll see a number of French guns. These guns were brought over to help Virginia and the colonies during the Revolution. And if you look at it from the far side, you'll see uh, the gun closest to you is a uh, gun from Letcher's Virginia uh, artillery battery during the Civil War. This gun is a 13-inch, um, uh, excuse me, a 3-inch rifled gun. It sits in front of the VMI mess hall. Uh, when the Civil War was taking place, the cadets preferred using this gun of all the Civil War era guns on VMI because it was more accurate than the other guns on the Institute. In 1861, there, was, there were some members of the Confederate Congress who considered establishing a national uh, Confederate military school at VMI, the equivalent to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, but it never had any legs. Um, Confederacy, of course, had um, state sovereignty was a key issue, and Bruce has the article. If you want to read about uh, Confederate military schools, read Bruce's article on it. Uh, the, the South had a number of military schools in 1861. There was GMI in uh, Georgia, Marietta, Georgia. There's still a building left of it. And one of the guns from that, that school is down there by the Confederate cemetery. There was a North Carolina Military Institute in Charlotte. There, was, uh, um, there were a number of military schools across the South to include uh, South Carolina, which had the uh, arsenal and the citadel um, as a military school. The only two that really survived the Civil War as military schools today are VMI and the Citadel. Uh, in 18, Jefferson Davis did appoint, uh, go back please now, just one. Yeah, um, Jefferson Davis did appoint 53 cadets to VMI's class of 1862, and I surmise that was uh, more as a symbolic um, matter than anything else. Inside VMI's archives, if you get a chance to do that as a historian, um, there is correspondence between VMI's superintendent and the superintendents of the other military schools in the South. Uh, VMI was really, was, in my to my knowledge, the oldest of those military schools founded in 1839. Uh, but it's not long before the Civil War, it's just 22 years before it. Um, but it was used as a pattern for a number of the other schools. And the one in Baton Rouge, um, Louisiana, of course, William Tecumseh Sherman was the superintendent of that uh, military school. And VMI has some correspondence between Sherman and the Institute. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Alan. This is a um, visitor sign at the gates entering VMI. Uh, the, barracks, um, the barracks sit at the top of this map, and on the left side, on the left of the parade ground, is where there's faculty housing. On the right side of this map, you'll see um, uh, up there, that's where the, the academic buildings are. And on top, this is, it's built on a plateau, so when you get down below the plateau, that's where they have their sports, class, sports training and the military training. On top of the plateau, that's where the academic buildings are. So in VMI academic parlance, they talk about being on the hill for academic instruction. Below the hill is where they have their sports and their military training. 
this is a gun that sits at the entrance to VMI by the limits gates. Uh, this is a 12-pound howitzer. Uh, there's a sister gun to this 12-pound howitzer that's somewhere in the Potomac River. Uh, I, the last time I talked with Keith Gibson at VMI, it had not been recovered. As the Army of Northern Virginia retreats from the Battle of Antietam, there's a disaster that unfolds there at Shepherdstown with getting the artillery back across the river. And uh, uh, the sister gun, uh, this hasn't been found yet. This gun was present at the execution of John Brown. So on, on December 2nd of 1859, this gun witnessed that uh, execution of Brown there in Charlestown, West Virginia. This is Matthew Fontaine Morey. Uh, the building just behind that gun was named Morey Brook Hall. Morey was a celebrated um, oceanographer who studied ocean currents. And uh, he studied the way, way that ships could sail and use these currents to their advantage to shave sailing time um, when making their voyages. And those were critical things during the clipper ship days. When the Civil War broke out, Matthew Fontaine Morey went south. He became the Confederate Navy's chief of seacoast, river, and harbor defenses. Um, there are historians who claim that um, Morey's mines in the rivers and harbors sank more federal shipping and did more damage to Union ships than did um, all the um, commerce raiders the Confederates had during the Civil War. This is a picture of John Mercer Brook late in life. Uh, John Mercer Brook was present with Admiral, um, with Commodore Perry when he went to Japan to open up for trading. Um, during the Civil War, uh, John Mercer Brook designed guns. And uh, this is a gun from the CSS Texas. You'll note that the Brook gun has a uh, reinforcing ring around the breech, and that characterizes Brooks, uh, Brooks's guns. Four of the guns that were aboard the CSS Virginia, the Merrimack, they're in the Battle of Hampton Roads. Four of those guns were designed by uh, Brook. This is one of Brooks's guns in the Washington Navy Yard. And this is a gun from Brooks that was defending uh, Drury's Bluff there, uh, south of Richmond, to defend the approaches to Richmond during the war. Um, and this is an eight inch gun. The statue of General Smith. Uh, General Smith was a, a colonel during the Civil War primarily, but Smith was VMI superintendent. And he kept the institute operating throughout the war. In fact, he must have liked the job he took when he became VMI superintendent. He held it for, the, for 50 years. Um, uh, when things got tough for VMI as the war went on, Smith would use his own funds, uh, his and his wife's funds, and they would help purchase uh, uh, boots, supplies from Europe, so the cadets would always have the uniforms they needed to keep, um, keep in operation during the war. Opposite the parade ground from uh, Smith statue is this of the Jackson Battery. You'll see four smooth smoothbore guns in front of the barracks. And the cadets trained with these guns prior to the Civil War. In fact, Jackson offered artillery instruction at VMI uh, using these four guns. These are six-pounder Mexican War era guns. They are lighter by 200 pounds each than the traditional US Army six-pounder guns. And that's the reason these wheels and the trails of these guns are painted red, because that's the call to attention to you as a gunner that this is a training gun. Therefore, don't put the powder, the amount of powder in this gun that you would put in a traditional six-pound gun. You have a very good likelihood of blowing the gun up. So that's why uh, it's, it's just a training gun. Nonetheless, these guns were used early on in the Civil War. They used it at the Battle of First uh, Bull Run. They used them uh, in the Valley. Jackson had them up there uh, north early on in the war when he was at Harper's Ferry and they did some work along the Potomac to damage, to destroy the um, CNO Canal. They were up with Jackson then. They also were at the Battle of Malvern Hill. But as the war progressed, the Napoleon gun that they had, the 12 powder, just outranged these guns. And as you know, in the military, if your gun shoots farther than the other person's gun, uh, you're at a significant disadvantage. Those, these guns really didn't see any service after that point in time. Oh, I'll go back one more time. Um, be between the guns, you'll see um, a, a raised marker. And underneath that marker, that's where the bones of Little Sorrel, Jackson's uh, Civil War horse, are, are buried. Inside the VMI uh, Museum, uh, this is Little Sorrel. Um, not, an, not a very impressive steed by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, a little story on my own. When I, re, when I matriculated at VMI, there had been a power outage. 
and the glue that held little Sorrel's hide onto the model had melted, and little Sorrel's hide was on the ground. <laughs> so they had to reconnect all this stuff to, to uh, uh, refashion little Sorrel into the horse he is today. It's not an impressive horse. I would imagine Jackson's feet hung pretty close to the ground, uh, not far above it. He was, he was 5'11", he was a fairly tall man. This is the coat, the raincoat he was wearing at Chancellorsville uh, when he was wounded. You'll see the bullet hole uh, in that coat not far below the left shoulder. So when he was wounded, it was fairly high up on the shoulders. So Dr. Hunter McGuire had to amputate the arm uh, at the shoulder to remove it. Um, so it was, um, it, was, it was a significant wound for Jackson. Across from the museum uh, it, on the barracks of VMI, you'll see this marker. Uh, immediately be above this marker is where Jackson had his um, classroom. The classroom was not just this room above the marker, but there were two rooms, one on either side. And during the time of the Civil War, Jackson's classroom was far larger than this, the classroom that's just above that marker. On the north post at VMI, you'll see this um, a military training area for the cadets. As you come through the gates, you'll see a small plaza off to the right. And at that plaza is a 10-pounder Parrot gun. Uh, this was Captain Roberts Parrot's gun, uh, a replica of it, that VMI tested there in 1860, about on the north, where the north side of the old barracks are at VMI. That's where it's believed that Jackson tested the 10-pounder Parrots for Virginia's decision on determination on whether or not to purchase Parrot guns uh, to support the Confederate efforts in the Civil War. And to the right of that gun was a uh, marker and it just says that during the Civil War, Jackson provided the artillery instruction at VMI. If you had been standing on this parapet, if you'd walked up the stairs and been standing on this parapet on, at the noon hour of April 21st of 1861, you would have heard Jackson give his first commands of the Civil War. They were battalion attention, right face, by the file left, march. And this is a picture depicting Stephen Lang, the actor, as Jackson um, leading the cadets off to train the army who was assembling in, in Richmond to fight the Civil War. The only trouble with this picture is, um, for Hollywood purposes, they're marching towards Kentucky, <laughs> <laughs> which is not where they marched. They marched the other direction. A uh, little artistic license there by the director. Go ahead, Ali. This is much more uh, authentic uh, uh, version of it. Um, uh, Mort Kunstler's uh, print. Um, you have Jackson and a Major Gilliam. He was from Vincennes, Indiana. And Major Gilliam graduated West Point with Sherman. I believe he's one notch above Sherman, the West Point class of 1846. Um, Jackson and Gilliam roomed together for one year after the, VM, after the barracks opened in 1851. They, they were bachelors. They roomed together one year in the tower, the right tower there at VMI. You'll note that Jackson and Gilliam are both wearing U.S. Army uniforms. Um, that's the standard practice at VMI. The faculty do wear U.S. Army uniforms. Um, and if the, if this picture shows a Jackson, Gilliam, seven other VMI officers, and 176 VMI cadets left the Institute that day to report to Camp Lee to begin to train the Confederate troops who were assembling there. They march off on the 21st of April. Of course, Virginia secedes on the 17th of April. So <clears throat> uh, this, I don't know if they actually had a flag for the Confederacy flying above the barracks that soon, four days after the uh, secession was announced, but this is a print that shows it. Um, I do think the artist took some license, though. <clears throat> if you look at the steed that Jackson is riding here, and you just saw what Little Sorrel looked like, uh, this is not an impressive steed. Uh, this is, looks more like one you see in the Kentucky Derby. Little Sorrel doesn't look anything like that, but again, the artist has some uh, opportunities to uh, enhance, his, uh, enhance the drawing. And put this together, I thought these are some interesting numbers for you. Um, this shows, uh, of, the, of the VMI alumni at, alive at the time of the Civil War, 94% of them do serve in the armed forces. Um, 17 do serve in the Union Army in one capacity or other, uh, although the overwhelming majority serve in the Confederate service. The numbers that really struck me, uh, I guess a couple of them stand out. One of them is the field grade officers, the number of colonels, lieutenant colonels, and majors. That's 270. That's an enormous number of um, staff officers and regimental brigade type commanders to provide for one school. When within a couple of months of secession, in June of 1861, fully a third of the regimental officers uh, uh, for Virginia units 
um, are manned by or staffed by folks from VMI. You'll note too the number of general officers from VMI is not very large. It's only 18 uh, for the Confederacy and just one for the Union. Keep in mind the institute had been around just 22 years when uh, Virginia seceded. West Point had been around for about 60 years. So you've got a, an enormous difference in time. To graduate, to have your general officers, you generally want some more training uh, than just the few years would have provided, uh, uh, offered by VMI. But the colonels and generals, uh, the colonels, lieutenant colonels and majors are the field officers. They perform a critical role in the Army. And that is the generals have the vision of how to ex execute a battle and win it. Uh, the soldiers, of course, have to execute it and do all the work. But what the field grade folks do is they translate all the general's visions into orders for the soldiers to execute. So the ideas in the battlefield, the artillery goes here, the supply wagons go rear, the ammunition comes forward, the cavalry goes over here. Uh, you'll take this road, your division takes this road. All those things are coordinated by the field officers, uh, assigning times for movement and places to assemble. That's what the field grade officers do. And as the war progresses, you'll see what happens to some of these numbers as they change. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Douglas Southall Freeman, who I saw spoke here to the Civil War Roundtable one time years ago, um, he does credit that if it hadn't been for those number of officers from VMI in the Army of Northern Virginia, he doesn't believe the campaigns of 1862 could have been waged so successfully uh, for Lee's army. These are the barrack towers, the very towers you saw that Jackson and um, you saw Jackson riding past. The, the room that's just above, you know, let's see, the tower closest to me, this tower on this, this floor, the third floor up, that's the room Jackson actually occupied uh, when he was there living in the barracks for one year. He and Gilliam shared, shared that room. We now have a young man from Indiana named uh, uh, Broker, Andrew Broker. He was quarterback of Zionsville's football team a couple years ago. He's now sharing that room with, I believe, a young man who's a wrestler from Valparaiso, Indiana. They didn't know that was Jackson's old classroom until I told, talked with his dad and mom back uh, in last November. But uh, they still they use those historic rooms that are at VMI's barracks where these folks stayed in. New cadets will still use those rooms. The cadets, as a general rule, don't pay any attention to the heritage of the rooms they're in. They're going to class, writing papers, taking tests, doing sporting events, military drills. So they have the reflection to look back and see where they're at. They don't do that. They're just living life and going through it at the time. This is an interesting map, I thought. This is the, um, um, this map is in, in the book that Colonel Cooper assembled. It shows Jackson's movements from the time he left BMI with the cadets to go uh, to train the army at Richmond. And it shows his movements up and down the Shenandoah Valley. It shows them at Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, down by Richmond, and Tetum, the Romney marches. But it has this entire military career of Jackson in the Civil War, all his movements, to include his last movement of uh, being brought to Guinea Station to recover. And then after Jackson dies, uh, Jackson's body being removed back down to Richmond, to Lyon State, the state capital, and then the Confederate national capital, then return on railroad to Lynchburg, and then by packet boat up to uh, uh, Lexington from uh, Lexington, Virginia, from Lynchburg, Virginia. <laughs> and this is a picture of Jackson's remains. Uh, a painting of, of Jackson's remains as Jackson's um, body was returned to the barracks at VMI on May 14th of 1863. Uh, you'll note that Jackson's body is covered by what's called the stainless banner. This was the banner the Confederacy had adopted to use in place of the stars and bars they had early in the war, uh, which was a confusing flags when the flags were, un were not fully unfurled because the, the Confederate banner and the U.S. flag had enormous similarities. And, as you know, that they often had um, uniforms were not standardized early on in the war. So there was confusion in the battlefield. It was thought the stainless, stainless banner would resolve that. It doesn't because it looks like a white surrender flag if you had the red, that Union is, or that Canton is, is close to where the, the uh, flagstaff is. Um, so it doesn't resolve the problem. But that's, that was a stainless banner that they had there in May of 1863. Uh, this is the uh, this is another three-pounder that was similar. That's the sister gun of the one that was in front of the mess hall at VMI. This is a um, this gun is at Newmarket, and Newmarket is central to VMI's lore. You'll see the gun is faced is pointed towards the Bushong farmhouse um, at Newmarket, Virginia. This is just outside the town of Newmarket. Uh, there's a blacksmith shop in like the the cabin that's between the farmhouse, the white farmhouse, and the gun. Um, but at the Battle of Newmarket. 
after they, the, the sides of position had moved a bit on the battlefield. But at one point in the battle, the Confederate line is just on the other side of this farmhouse and uh, just past the, the orchard right behind it, another 100 yards or so. And the Union line was about 300 yards past that. And when the troops were exchanging fire with each other, there was a break in the Confederate lines. And at that point in time, the Confederate general commanding, who was uh, General Breckinridge, Breckinridge gives the command, uh, put the boys in and may God have mercy on me for the order. So the VMI Cadet Corps is placed in the line of battle. And C and D companies uh, shown here move on the left side of the house. A and B companies move on the right side of the house. They move through the orchard behind it. Uh, they come under fire and that's where the cadets experience some of their first casualties in the battle. They then reform and they exchange fire. They, with the, they're in the center of the Confederate line. And for about an hour, they exchange fire with the Union forces too. There's a Confederate uh, infantry regiment that goes along the bluffs overlooking the uh, North Fork of the Shenandoah. They help get among some of the Union guns and the Union artillery fire slackens. And at the point of the slackening of the fire, the cadets on their own just, just initiate a charge up the hill towards the Union position. Seeing the cadets charge, the rest of the rebel line charges as well. And so they get among uh, the Union guns at the top. As they proceed up to the top of the guns, it had rained there for four days prior um, to the battle. And so the field is just soaked, it's just mud. And a number of the cadets lose their shoes uh, charging across that field. So they call the field that they're there, the field of lost shoes. This is a, um, one of the cadets, uh, Oliver Perry, um, Oliver Hazard Perry, getting among the federal guns. Uh, this is one of Von Kleiser's guns atop the hill there at Newmarket. And they seize this gun. They also capture, the cadets do capture between 60 and 100 Union prisoners. The poor Union prisoners are sent down to Andersonville um, after this battle. Um, but it, for, the, for the Confederates, it's a, it's a victory, and it's the last victory the Confederates have in the Civil War. This is a, this is a, a statue of Virginia mourning her dead. One of the cadets in that battle was Moses Ezekiel. Um, at Newmarket, 10 cadets die, 47 are wounded. Of the 10 who die, the remains of six of them are entombed underneath this monument at VMI. Moses Ezekiel knew these six cadets who were entombed uh, under this monument. The Institute not only, not only has those tangible aspects of, of the Civil War you just saw, but it also has, uh, it was also the, the scene of one of the 10,500 engagements during the Civil War. Uh, this is a view of the toll house uh, that sits across the Maury River today. It used to be the North Fork of the James River. And you'll see an SUV, a vehicle there, and it's over an abutment for a bridge. Uh, uh, another, go ahead, Allie. And this is that bridge abutment from the, from the near side. At the time of the Civil War, there was a, uh, this bridge was spanned. And uh, Keith Gibson, the VMI Museum Director, when we talked about it, he believes it was likely a covered bridge. And on June 11th of 1864, Union forces under General David Hunter approached the Institute from the far side uh, of the river. Um, McClausland had cadets placed inside the, that bridge to fire it. So that they, they set bales of hay in there and they set the bridge on fire. So when the bridge burned, uh, before the Federals could take it, it caused the Union forces to have to go up and downstream to find a ford. And when they found a ford, they could cross it and get into Lexington. But it bought time for VMI. And those few hours were used to rescue the records. So if you're a historian wishing to do research, VMI has these records going back to 1839. They had those additional hours to save the records. Just as if you knew a tornado was coming and you had a few hours to get things out of the house, what do you save? That's what they saved. They did not have horses, so they couldn't take the cannons. They couldn't take most of their uniforms, their books. They couldn't take the library from VMI. All that was left in the barracks. So. 98% of what they had had to be left behind. The cadets could carry their weapons, any ammunition they could take, whatever rations they could take, but they left the rest of it. And on June 11th of 1864, the Federals did take the Institute. Uh, this, is a, this is a central tower of old barracks at VMI, East Barracks. Uh, you can see here what looks like three cannonballs sticking in the side of the barracks. Well, they're not actually cannonballs today, but they show about where they would have hit the barracks. And uh, you, you wouldn't leave cannonballs with college students living inside that building. Uh, no insurance company would allow you to do that. So th those are replicas of where they were. But they're there, and you can see where they would have hit VMI during the side time of the Civil War. This is the institute as it looked after it was burned. Um, so it's a totally devastated institute. And you can see what it looks like today. 
that same picture. Of the uh, eight, nearly 1,800 VMI alumni who served in the Confederate forces, um, a lot of them had impacts in certain key battles. One of them, of course, was Chancellorsville. Uh, Jackson, on the date of his flanking attack, uh, notes the significant number of VMI leaders that he had uh, in the column, and he comments to uh, Thomas Munford, who was commander of the 2nd Virginia Cavalry, uh, the Institute will be heard from today. Uh, and many of the people who Jackson was marching with that day were folks he had trained when he was a VMI cadet. The first two divisions that are shown there in the attack, Roy Colston and Robert Rhodes, both of those folks were VMI faculty members with Jackson. He knew them well. The third uh, division commander there, of course, is A.P. Hill, went to West Point. The, cadets, uh, the, the alumni from VMI not only play a, a key role in primarily in the East, where the Virginia units are, but also a number of them were in the West. Uh, this is a battle of, uh, this, this is a Civil War, um, Civil War Trust, now American Battlefield Trust map. And uh, this, the Battlefield Trust was very gracious to give permission to use, um, use their maps for this presentation. Uh, I think they're some of the best Civil War maps around. But it shows the breakout of the Confederate forces there on the morning of um, the 15th of February of uh, 1862. Two of those regiments that helped break that, break the Union line are John McClausland's, who would later direct the burning of the bridge at VMI, and Gabriel Wharton, also who later became a Confederate general in the Valley. Both of those units, both those regiments help in breaking it open. When the Union Army reseals the, the Confederate forces behind uh, uh, the defenses there at Fort Donelson, Gabriel Wharton's regiment and the regiment of John McClausland escape across the river on steamers. And of course, Nathan Bedford Forrest Cavalry escape from Fort Donelson too, as well. So those three units, Gabriel Wharton's, John McClausen's uh, Confederate Infantry Regiments and the uh, Nathan Bedford Force Cavalry do not surrender with the rest of the Confederate Army there at Fort Donaldson. What I, the crux of what I wanted to share with you tonight after setting the story are, are four uh, vignettes of VMI 20th century folks from the military and you know, I saw Civil War echoes in what um, their 20th century experiences were. And to share that with you, uh, I would like to um, begin by sharing a, an experience that I had at VMI um, during my cadetship. And that was, I was from, I was born here in Chicago, grew up in Northwest Indiana. And so when there was Thanksgiving, Christmas, Passover, there was no way I was leaving the Institute, come back here for Chicago for a very short time then going back to Virginia. And so I was fortunate to be adopted into the family there for those, those years of my cadetship by my roommate's family. They were from Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, my roommate's father had also gone to VMI. Uh, Joe Wyatt Sr. was a member of VMI's class of 1943. And they had their class reunion during my cadetship, uh, one of their class reunions. And it was during that, um, that reunion that I had, had an experience with Mr. Wyatt's family that I thought was, was quite different. Uh, reunions were very much the same at VMI as you would have at other colleges. You have a golf outing, a sporting event, uh, dance parties and the like. But the reunion weekends ended in that era with a chapel service uh, here at VMI's chapel. And that particular time, I, went, I sat with my roommate's family for that, uh, that church service. And during the service, the chaplain began to read the names of the cadets from the former cadets from the class of 1943, who were not there that day. And I looked through the worship service bulletin, and it looked very much like you would see almost like a history book, and the chaplain began to read the names. Lieutenant Hawes Adams, U.S. Army Air Force, killed Afri in Africa in 1943. Lieutenant Marvis Marvin Anderson, U.S. Army Air Force, killed North Africa in 1943. Lieutenant Beverly Blackburn, U.S. Army, killed Germany in 1945. And he would continue to go through the list. And my roommate's mother, she leaned over to me and she said, David, do you know all these men are heroes? Well, I had been in and out of VMI many times through the years. Hundreds of times I'd walked through these arches. And as you go through the arches to enter the barracks or leave the barracks, you'll walk past um, plaques on the sides of the barracks. And on the plaques are the names of cadets from uh, prior generations who gave their lives in service to their country. And every barracks you walk, by, you walk past, you will see these names. Um, you cannot enter and leave the barracks of VMI without seeing the names on these plaques. And the war is, of course, more current and some not as current. But all the, all the arches have plaques on them to the cadets. 
uh, former cadets who have passed on in military service. So the cadets may not know these names, but somebody did. In my cadet experience, they also had inside the chapel pictures of the paintings or pictures of the cadets who served in the Battle of Newmarket uh, top. They've taken those off since, but they were there in my era. And in the balcony, uh, underneath the balcony, the far side there, you can see just to the right, uh, on the right side of the balcony, you can see part of a uh, oval portrait. And there's one on each side, and those were BMI somewhat patron saints of Lee and Jackson. And of course, uh, there's a battle, um, there's a, there's a battle scene there at the, at the front of the chapel. Well, I didn't know, I didn't know the members of the class of 1943 other than my roommate's father. But I began to appreciate at that very day that the names that are on those plaques, to me they were just names on plaques, I didn't know them. But to the class of 1943, those were roommates, or those were teammates, or those were classmates who were no longer there with the, um, no longer there with their classmates that day. When my roommate's father matriculated to VMI, this was the superintendent. It was Charles Kilburn, a uh, name not many of us know today. General Kilburn was the first American soldier to receive the nation's three highest military honors, the Distinguished Service Medal, the Distinguished Service Cross, and the Medal of Honor. And my roommate's father told, had told me and Joe about a, a story um, that happened to him during his cadetship, and the date was on November 11th, 1939. For that day, General Kilburn had invited back the alumni who had served in World War I, the Great War, for a reunion. But the reunion date was not only going to be for these folks, this reunion date was VMI's 100th anniversary. So this was going to be a big day. VMI invited the presidents or chancellors from other American colleges and universities to attend the event. And at the event, VMI would dedicate uh, its new library, Preston Library. And the speaker they had invited for the, for the dedication and for this 100th anniversary was none other than the President of the United States who had accepted. And to top the day off of November 11th, 1939, uh, there would be a big event that evening at VMI, a uh, big dance that night too. And just as events would happen uh, this day too, November 11th of 1939 happened to be a Saturday. And of course, a Saturday, uh, Saturday means in the fall, uh, that's football day. Go ahead back. Back on, thank you. Yeah, November 11th means, uh, November 11th that year was a Saturday, so it meant football. Um, and VMI was going to have a big football game that day because the prior year, uh, the Institute's football team had lost just one football game, that was the Navy. And their opponent they were playing that day was the uh, conference champion from the prior season uh, that they hadn't been able to schedule uh, because the conference had, I think it was 16 football teams at the time, so they couldn't get them in. So, in um, the conference champion they were playing that day had been so good the prior year, 1938, they had done, not only gone through the season undefeated, but they had done something you don't see in college football. They had been unscored upon. So good were Wallace Wade's Duke Blue Devils in 1938 that they went to the Rose Bowl. And there, before 93,000 fans in Pasadena, Duke led Southern Cal's Trojans to the final moments when Cal, Southern Cal's fourth string quarterback lofted a pass for a touchdown and upset Duke 7-3. to three. Those were the only points Duke surrendered in the 1938 football season, and VMI was to host Duke that afternoon. Well, <clears throat> it's an interesting story, Dave. What, any, what does any of that have to do with the Civil War? Well, it all has to do with the Civil War and even the football game. That day, the president came and he gave his talk, <clears throat> and, he's, and he's, that day the president gave his, gave his talk, and he talked about uh, the immortal name of Stonewall Jackson is a part of the imperishable history of VMI. And then FDR said that his dauntless chief, that knightly figure, another of the great commanders of history, Robert E. Lee. After the president's remarks, the cadets fired a battery. They didn't fire these guns, though. They fired the old Jackson battery, the Civil War guns at that time. And Jackson's, um, and the Preston Library would be dedicated to this man, uh, who was a Confederate colonel, John Thomas Lewis Preston. Uh, he was VMI's founder, who was president at the hanging of John Brown, and it was Preston who intoned, uh, so perished all such enemies of Virginia, all such enemies of the Union, and all foes of the human race. This is a well-known Civil War photograph. Um, I know, I imagine everybody in this room has seen this before. Um, I've seen it as well, but when I see this photograph, I don't only think of it, the date it was taken right after Appomattox, 
and it's from behind the Lee residence they had in Richmond at the time. But I also think of that football game in 1939, and this is why. The man standing to the left of Robert E. Lee is George Washington Custis Lee, one of his sons who was Confederate general in the Civil War. Uh, after the war, jobs would be scarce, especially since the South was fairly devastated. Uh, George Washington Custis Lee did accept a position at VMI to become a professor of mechanical engineering after the war. Um, and Robert E. Lee is seated there. Um, his situation was a bit different. He had been offered the pres presidency of VMI, but he was done with the military, as you know. And so he, he turned that down. But before the war, uh, in March of 1861, um, to entice Robert E. Lee into going south, the Virginia General Assembly had passed a bill to disinter the remains of Robert E. Lee's father, Light Horse Harry Lee, from his grave in Georgia, remove his, bring his remains back to Virginia and bury them on the grounds of the Institute. Um, and, um, I'm sorry, Alec, let me ask you to go back. And so when Lee went south, Mary Lee stayed behind with the daughters and they packed up the family silver, the paintings, uh, the papers they had from George Washington from Mount Vernon that they, that they had inherited, um, the personal fix they had in their home in Arlington, and they took them to Richmond. As the war moved in on Richmond, closed in, Mary Lee wished to secure the family, Lee family valuables. So many of the, more, the, many of the more valuable things, items they had, they placed in two trunks, and they sent them to Lexington, Virginia. John Hempsey is shown here on the left. He was at VMI as a sergeant during the Civil War. Sergeant Hempsey took those two trunks of Lee valuables up to a barn in Fairfield, Virginia, which is about four or five miles north of Lexington, where VMI is. And there, under the floorboards of a barn, Hempsey buried the Lee, those two Lee trunks. Um, 18,000 Union soldiers coming through the valley. None of them thought to look under the floorboards of the barn for the valuables of the Lee family. So the situation that faced Robert E. Lee was, um, then in 1865, after the war, with the son teaching at VMI, with the valuables uh, that the Lees had uh, there in Lexington area, they didn't know where exactly, uh, when Washington College next door to VMI offered a position to Lee to be its president, Lee accepted it and came to Lexington, Virginia to become president of, uh, the president of Washington College. And that gets me to the football, well, that gets, that gets me sort of the football game. Uh, the, the stands in the foreground don't exist in 1939 when this football game is played. Uh, the only stands that VMI had in 1939 that were permanent stands were those on the far side of the football field. This is what those permanent stands looked like. There was no way they could fit the thousands of fans expected that day for a big game uh, with Duke to fit there on those few, those few small uh, concrete uh, bleachers. Uh, they had some temporaries they could put on, but they couldn't seat the crowd. So what VMI did was it approached this neighboring college, the College of Washington and Lee, to hold its football game on the old Wilson Field of what's now the University of Washington Lee. So the irony was that the largest crowd ever to see a VMI football game in its hometown of Lexington, Virginia, never saw the football game played at VMI's football field. It was played next door in the football field of Washington Lee. And that gets me to the third person in the picture, uh, Walter Heron Taylor. It was Colonel Taylor, if you saw the movie uh, Gettysburg, the staff officer who's there with Lee early on and, and, and talks about uh, something, welcome to Pennsylvania, we have flapjacks and all the, all the great food here from Pennsylvania for you to eat. Um, that staff officer, that was Major Taylor. Uh, Taylor was a VMI graduate. And after the war, uh, he went back home to Norfolk, uh, married. Uh, when Lee died, he came back to Lexington, was a pallbearer at Lee's funeral. And then um, he and his wife had a son. And that son was Walter, Her Walter Heron Taylor Jr., became VMI's first head football coach. So even the football program is, has ties to the Civil War at VMI. What I'd like to share with you, the, the crux is of some four short vignettes. The first one is involving Albert K. Ernest. Albert K. Ernest transferred from the Army to the Navy, became an ensign, learned how to fly these TBF-1 Avengers. And after training, he received one of the dream assignments you receive if you're ever in the US Armed Forces, that he was posted to Hawaii. Uh, 
and he was assigned there with five other members of his squadron. Fifteen other pilots in Ernest Torpedo Squadron 8 were assigned uh, to the U.S. carrier, the USS Hornet. That spring of 42, Navy intelligence determined that a large Japanese fleet was streaming east, sailing east, across the Pacific. And so Ernest and his five fellow TBF-1 Avenger pilots were re repositioned from Hawaii to an atoll the furthest out on the Hawaiian chain. That atoll, halfway between San Francisco and uh, Tokyo, uh, is Midway. On the morning of June 4th of 1942, uh, PBYs from the U.S. Navy identified the Japanese plate that was, same, that was steaming that way. The 15 planes took off from the deck of the Hornet, and the six planes took off Midway. They were to rendezvous over their objective, the Japanese fleet. Uh, Nimitz's three carriers there at Midway were all the Navy had left, along with the planes there at Midway, to stop the uh, Japanese Navy from proceeding across the Pacific. The remains of the, of the U.S. Navy there at uh, Pearl Harbor, you had, you had sunken hulks and you had tugs, but there was nothing of any consequence to stop the Japanese Navy. So that, the, the Navy had to win the battle. So the situation that Albert K. Ernest faced that morning was somewhat akin to the situation the cadets faced in the Battle of New Market. Um, those Navy pilots, Marine pilots, hadn't been, uh, uh, hadn't been in combat before. This would be their first time. And so the, uh, cadets, the cadets' charge here at New Market was a similar event. They had not been in battle either before. Uh, the painting has somewhat of an allegorical uh, uh, touch to it, or the metaphor to it. That is, um, if you look at the front rank of the cadets uh, who are charging, about the fourth or fifth cadet in the front rank uh, nearest to you is reeling backward. The painter painted the face of his son onto that, um, that cadet reeling backward. Uh, and he actually had cadets pose for the, for the painting as he painted it. Uh, it takes place on the hill outside of the town of Newmarket. Um, and you'll see the storm, it's, the sky is stormy, lightning cross, cuts the, across the sky. Um, but the painting has an overtone to it as well, and that is uh, a core is a body. It comes from the Latin word corpus. So the overtone, uh, uh, the metaphor for this thing is, if you think about it, you have a death of a sun on a hill outside of town. It's in the springtime. Uh, the, sky is, the sky is an angry sky. It's um, uh, lightning's tearing the, the, the temple curtain in two. So it's really somewhat of a metaphor for a crucifixion. Um, and you could, you could look at it that way, but it also conveys another picture image as well. And that is, the picture asks every cadet who's in the chapel at VMI, uh, if you had been in the cadet corps in 1864, do you have the courage in you that they had in them? In other words, can you do, when your time is called, what they were called to do when it was their turn to go in the barrel? So that day on June 4th of, 8, of 1942, uh, the 21 planes of the Torpedo Squadron 8 attacked the Japanese, attempted to attack the Japanese fleet. The challenge was the Japanese had already had their zeros in the air. So of those first, that first squadron that went in at Midway that day, of the 15 planes that took off from the, from the Hornet, not one plane returns. And of the six that took off from Midway in that first wave, only one plane comes back. It has a wheel shot out. Um, as it lands uh, and comes to a stop, Albert K. Ernest is alive, uh, his uh, radio operator is alive, his gunner uh, is dead. Of the first 48, of the 48 crew members of Torpedo Squadron 8, only three survived. Another survivor was one of the folks from the carrier who was picked up later on. But the casualties were very high from that first run on Midway. Later on, of course, the U.S. Navy is able to attack and uh, uh, could sink uh, four fleet carriers. So by the end of June 4th of 1942, the uh, Japanese uh, fleet is the, the uh, uh, four of their carriers in the bottom of the Pacific. It's the worst defeat the Japanese Navy receives uh, in 300 years. Albert K. Ernest would go on to fly another uh, 28 missions for the Marine Corps, for the Marines and the Solomons, and he would fly another 55 missions uh, for the war, excuse me, for the Navy. And after the war, he'd fly 55 missions in the Pacific Theater. In 1972, Albert K. Ernest retired. Among his decorations were three Navy crosses, two air medals, a purple, purple Heart, and other decorations. He died in 2009. He's interred at Arlington Cemetery. He was a 1938 graduate of VMI. 
Well, the Japanese Navy suffered its first defeat in the war at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese Army didn't, suffered its first defeat at Guadalcanal. On October 24th of 1942, Chesty Poor <clears throat> commanded the 1st Battalion of 7th U.S. Marines on Guadalcanal. His instructions that day were to hold a very thin line of Marines. They were reinforced by U.S. Army soldiers uh, to defend uh, Henderson Field. If Henderson Field fell to the Japanese, the Japanese would overrun it and the resupply of U.S. forces would be exceedingly difficult. So that night on October 24th, the U.S. Marines uh, fought the Japanese, repeated attacks. It was sometimes hand-to-hand. -hand. Polar's actions that day are reminiscent of <clears throat> situation that Jackson faced at 2nd Manassas when he had to, his forces arrived early. And they had to hold off against Pope's army that was increasing at attacking in ever-increasing numbers as McClellan's forces re continued to arrive from the peninsula. And the attacks got stronger on Jackson's forces. But Jackson knew the, the forces had to hold until the rest of the army was up to relieve it. The situation was very much the same. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat at parts there at the 2nd Manassas. And finally, when Longstreet and Lee came up with the rest of the army, then they could hammer the attack in at the end of the day. So the Jackson's position was ultimately held and the Confederates had, for a second time, had driven the Union Army off the field at, at the Battle of Manassas. For his actions on the 24th of October of 1942, Louis B. Puller receives a Navy Cross and the Purple Heart. The Battle of Guadalcanal would last six months, and at the battle's end, the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army had inflicted the first defeat of the many the Japanese would receive in World War II. At Quantico, Virginia, not far from Manassas' battlefield, Iron Mike guards the entrance to the National Museum of the U.S. Marine Corps. A walkway leads past this, past the museum, and as you walk it, you'll see other monuments to the Marines, other memorials. And at the end of the walkway, there's a chapel with a statue of a Marine. The Marine is pointing uh, towards the U.S. Marine Corps Museum. It's a statue of the nation's most decorated Marine, Lieutenant General Lewis B. Chesty Puller. Among Puller's awards and decorations are five Navy Crosses, um, Purple Hearts, uh, Silver Star, um, just an incredible number of awards and decorations. Chesty Puller was a member of VMI's class of 1921. Terry Jones was a former Marine himself, and he created um, a Chesty Puller statue at Quantico. Jones said of Puller, the Puller carried two books with him into, Bible, into battle. One was, his, one was the Bible, and the other one was his biography of Stonewall Jackson. One of Jackson's maxims was that we may fail to take a position, but we never fail to hold it. Colonel Keith Gibson, who is VMI's museum director, and says that Jackson, is fond of saying that Jackson still teaches at VMI. Jackson quotes are found in VMI's main barracks arch. You'll find them in the VMI mess hall. And when the cadets drill on the parade ground at VMI, you'll see that they drill under the gaze of Stonewall Jackson's statue. Go down. Uh, this is the, of course, this is the stainless banner as a background. And I placed on it some figures that I thought would be of interest to you. Uh, they are a report from the VMI superintendent in June of 1863. And what the report notes is that of VMI's 460 graduates, on that date in June 26th of 1863. Fully uh, 95 are, are dead as a result of the war and another 90 are wounded. That's 40% um, on June, in June of 1863. Compare that, if you think of, of DePaul or Illinois or Northwestern or losing 40% of your alumni as casualties, 40% of your graduates are casualties. That's an enormous amount of casualties to have just two years of the war. And the report is June 26th on the eve of the most intense battle uh, of the Civil War. You'll note too that the uh, casualties are distributed uh, among all grades, uh, and particularly heavy are those casualties in the field grade ranks, the colonels, lieutenant colonels, and majors. In 1932, Frederick Ayer took a family trip to the Gettysburg battlefield. Uh, the tour guide for that battlefield uh, tour that day was going to be the family's great uncle George, now, Great Uncle George was a World War I veteran, and he took the family to the same places on Gettysburg that you may have visited with your family, 
the wheat field, the peach orchard, big round top, little round top, the devil's den. And as they approached each one of these places, great uncle George would tell the family what transpired in each of these places. Then they arrived at the angle, the copse of trees at Gettysburg. And it was here that the family walked past these, these copse of trees and they went and they stood um, along the wall. And as they stood on the wall, uh, Uncle George, uh, great uncle George to Frederick Ayer began to transform. It's as if his civilian clothes became a gray uniform. And the walking stick that Uncle George had, he would use that, that walking stick and he would begin to tell the story about what happened at Gettysburg. He talked about the position they were at when the guns would thunder that day from the Confederate side, there were 160 guns firing shells in the position where they were actually standing. The Union guns behind them of equal or greater nature of, of number would also return fire. So you had all these balls flying through the air and the earth was shaking where they were. Then, then great uncle George talked about when the artillery firing had stopped, you could hear the drums roll on the far side of the field and you could see the lines form up and you could see thousands of Confederate troops and then the flags would unfurl. There were three infantry divisions, nine brig comprising nine brigades, total of over 40 regimental flags formed up at the far side of the field. And they began to step off uh, almost, uh, almost as if on parade. If you have walked the field at Gettysburg, you have seen, it's, uh, the field undulates, so you walk down back and forth through the swales. So as those lines would approach, they would seem at a distance, and the next time the Confederates would appear to you as a Union soldier, they would be far closer. And they would continue on until you reach the Emmitsburg Road, where you had to take off the, uh, cross, take, go across the rails, uh, and get to cross over to approach the Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Ridge. As the Confederates approached that ridge, the numbers reduced significantly. Uh, there were no longer the many thousands, but now it's just hundreds would approach the wall. As they approached the wall, great uncle George told the story about how his great uncle, great uncle Taz, saw his old roommate from VMI. And it was roommate, roommate was Lewis B. Williams. Bob Crick has told me that when, as they got to the wall, Lewis Williams reached out and saw Taz and said, it's our turn next, Taz. And they grabbed each other's arms and went over the wall. Lewis B. Williams is killed almost instantly. Great uncle Taz was wounded. He dies three weeks later there at the Union Hospital at Gettysburg. Of note, at, at the charge, perhaps the most famous charge in American military history, <clears throat> Pickett's, Pickett's division was the only all Virginia division in Lee's army of those nine infantry divisions. Of Pickett's 15 infantry regiments, uh, 11 of those 15 were commanded by VMI officers when that charge began. Two more of them would be commanded by VMI officers in the course of the charge, such that by the charge's end, 13 of Pickett's 15 regiments are commanded by VMI graduates. Of the six other brigades in the uh, two other divisions there, the six other brigades, VMI officers also commanded four of those six. One of them was a James Marshall, who was a, a, a grandson of Chief Justice John Marshall of, of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, he dies in the, this battle as well. The casualties from VMI uh, uh, at, the, at Gettysburg are, are quite significant. Uh, most of them who participate in that charge are casualties that day. Go ahead, Alan. This is, a pickle, this is a picture of great uncle George's grandfather, who was another rebel colonel um, in the Civil War. Uh, this, was, this, this grandfather studied under Jackson, and he was struck and killed by a piece of shrapnel. And this piece of shrapnel is in VMI museums. The tour guide that Frederick Ayer had with his family that day, great uncle George, the box you see on the right, that's a box that great uncle George played with when he was a little boy. And the piece of shrapnel that you see there that would fit, fit through that the piece of cloth uh, that went and penetrated his grandfather's body, great uncle George played with that piece of shrapnel when he was a little boy. And of course the tour guide the family had that day uh, uh, was none other than this man. Uh, great uncle George was George Patton, the World War II general. Patton went to VMI in the class of 1907. He went to VMI for one year. And then he went to the US Military Academy at West Point and graduated the class of 1909. The Patton family, go back, Alec. 
the Patton family had, uh, the Civil War era Patton family had seven brothers. Uh, four of them went to VMI and uh, were VMI graduates. During the Civil War, the Patton family brothers commanded 11 different Confederate infantry regiments. Okay, yeah. My last, oh, one, one final thing in the Ayer family. Frederick Ayer would say for the rest of his life that when he recalled that Gettysburg trip, he couldn't think of that, that tour with great uncle George without a shiver going down his spine of all the places that he had taken him on that battlefield and the stories they told that day. I think perhaps the strangest story, my last one, vignette for you, it has a twist to it, was the one that was told to me by Cliff Kritzinger. I was in the VMI Alumni Hall, which is pictured at the top of this, this, um, this photograph. Uh, it's the far one, about the same height as Jack's, top of Jackson's head on the statue. And it was in this, when I was in there one night, I was, I was in the common area, and I was um, uh, going to watch a basketball game. And uh, ready to relax for the evening, and another VMI alumnus came in. I didn't know me for it at all. And we started exchanging pleasantries. And as you do sometimes as alumni, you ask what happened at the school when that person was there, somebody they may have known. <clears throat> and so I asked him during the commercial break, I asked him about an event that happened at the Institute. And so he, Cliff began to send, tell me the story. And um, this is a picture of Cliff Kritzinger from his cadet days. And it was such an intriguing story that I've, I've always remembered it. And uh, Cliff has given it permission for me to share with you tonight. Uh, so I'm not telling you out of, anything out of turn that Cliff hasn't allowed me to say. Cliff Kritzinger was from Buffalo, New York. And he came to VMI at the same time that this man was superintendent of VMI. This is George R.E. Shell. He was a Marine general. And uh, Shell reported the Institute in the fall, for the fall semester of, 18, of 1960. George R.E. Shell, if you were a casting director and you wanted somebody to play a U.S. Marine general, you would pick General Shell. He stood six feet, six foot two, he played football at VMI. He was broad-shouldered. When I've seen him, he was more broad-shouldered than this picture shows. Uh, he was a big man. He was also a fairly good-looking man and a good smile on his face. But he not only had the look of a Marine general, he also had the uh, resume of a Marine general. He had commanded a battalion of Marines at the Battle of Guadalcanal. In Otarola and at Saipan, he lost his left leg from the hip down. Yet with the prosthetic device, he walked with hardly a limp. You would think he only had a, a, a little crick in his leg from um, uh, standing on the wrong way or sitting the wrong way, but he would walk in, uh, about the Institute just getting around like anybody else. So you have Cliff Kritzinger, a new cadet from Buffalo, New York, kind of a wet behind the ears guy, arriving at a VMI run by this no-nonsense Marine Corps battle-hardened general. So this, is the, this sets, the, sets up the story for you about Cliff Kritzinger. <clears throat> Well, Cliff studied his, uh, did his duties. He did his military assignments, did his classwork, his sports work activities, physical education activities. But no matter how hard Cliff studied at VMI, at the end of two years, uh, the grades weren't just there, weren't there to allow him to stay. So he had to leave VMI, he was academically dismissed. Uh, yet, even with being dismissed from the Institute, Cliff vowed to return, see if he could find a way to return. So what Cliff did was he found a job back home in Buffalo, New York. He went to night school. And each, that semester, uh, that, that's, that ensuing fall semester, he got good grades. And he wrote back to VMI and he asked this man, uh, General Shell, to be, re no, to, to, to be uh, readmitted to VMI. He received a letter back from General Shell saying, no, you'd been dismissed for academic reasons. You're not allowed to, not allowed to return to the Institute. And so this Cliff didn't like the answer, so he went on to school. And he did the same thing that, that spring, got good grades, wrote back to VMI, asked to be readmitted, received the same response. No. He did the same thing in the summer. <clears throat> got good grades for summer school back in Buffalo and wrote back, but he hadn't heard back. That November, he received a letter. And the letter was from the superintendent. And General Shell's letter said, you've been conditionally reappointed to VMI. Uh, you have to make a certain grade point average. You can't go excess into merits. There are some conditions attached. But he could return to VMI in January. So what Cliff didn't know is behind the scenes, General Shell had gone to the Board of Visitors so that Cliff could be, again be readmitted to VMI. So Cliff was just ecstatic. He, this is exactly what, he would, what he'd hoped for. <clears throat> As Cliff continued going through that day's mail, 
Cliff said that the next letter he received was from the Selective Service. Cliff had been drafted. Now, as you recall back at that era, uh, if you were a full-time college student, you could be exempted from the draft. Cliff had been a part-time student at Buffalo, so he was not exempt from the draft. He had to report for induction. So he contacted his draft board. The draft board said, sorry, you've been drafted. You have to report for induction. Cliff said this doesn't make any sense. So he contacted his congressman from the state of New York there. And the congressman's office said they'll check into it. The next day they got back to Cliff and they said, you're reporting, you're reporting for induction. So Cliff had the same thought that, well, if the congressman can't do it, I'll go to the U.S. Senate. So he contacted both U.S. senators from the state of New York. Both senators' offices said, we'll get back to you in about a week. And so they did. They told Cliff, you're going to report for induction. So Cliff's situation was one that he wanted to return to the Institute, and he couldn't understand why he couldn't return, why he couldn't wait two more years and go back in the Army as an officer. So Cliff picked up the phone, and he asked the operator in Buffalo to connect him with the White House. So Cliff called the White House. And the White House operator, he laid out the whole story about getting into VMI, studying hard, being academically dismissed, draft board, getting his grades in, General Shell readmitting him finally, and the whole story. <clears throat> the operator heard it and said, Mr. Kritzinger, uh, hold on, just, I'll, I'll be back with you. So she went back in, and a few moments later she came back on and she said, Mr. Kritzinger, the president's in conference. <clears throat> But if you'll hold on, I think there's somebody who may help you. So the next voice on the, on the phone said, hello, this is Sergeant Shriver. What can I do for you? And so Cliff laid out the whole story, the whole thing for Sergeant Shriver. <clears throat> well, Sergeant Shriver, after hearing it, said, I want you to write that down. Write it down and send it to me here in the White House. So Cliff wrote the whole story down. He, went, he wrote it down and he put an envelope, went down to the Buffalo Post Office. He mailed it airmail. That's what he had doing those days. He mailed it airmail back to Washington. <clears throat> Shortly later, Cliff got a letter back from Selective Service. The letter said, your induction date has been extended 90 days. Well, that 90 days would allow him to come back to VMI in January from November and report back to the Institute and be a full-time student and be exempt from the draft. That week on Friday, President and Mrs. Kennedy flew to Dallas, Texas. And anybody in the room my age or older knows exactly where they were that day at noon on, on November 22nd of 1963. Well, I was stunned because the question I had asked Cliff was, what happened at VMI the day President Kennedy was assassinated? Cliff said, I don't know. I wasn't there. He came back to VMI in January. Well, I was stunned by the story. And then I remembered a story I'd been told at the alumni hall, right across from the alumni hall, 40 years before. And I looked at Cliff and I said, Cliff, do you know Forrest Pogue? Cliff looked at me and he shook his head. I said, no. I said, Cliff, let me share with you what, Colonel, what, what Forrest Pogue told me 40 years before at VMI. Forrest Pogue said there had been a VMI cadet the years before the Civil War, or before World War I, who desperately wanted to be a U.S. Army officer. But in those days, if you didn't go to West Point, unless you passed an examination, you weren't going to be a U.S. Army officer. And getting a seat for that examination was very difficult. So this young VMI cadet had asked the superintendent for a letter. And the letter said, this cadet is a boy the equal of the best of West Point. So armed with that letter, this, this VMI cadet before World War I took the letter uh, and he went to Washington to visit and see the U.S. Attorney General. The Attorney General had been a, uh, it was from the same state as that cadet, and the Attorney General met with him but said, there's nothing I can do. This is a War Department matter. So the cadet went to the home of John Hall. John Hall was the uh, chairman of what is now the U.S. Um, House Armed Services Committee. He met with the cadet for about an hour or so, but uh, Congressman Hall said there's nothing I can do, this is a War Department matter. So that VMI cadet, with considerable gumption, I might add, knew the chain of command, and he walked over to the White House. 
Now, in those days, you could walk over the White House. He walked to the White House to the anteroom, and there, uh, without an appointment, he wanted to see the president. Um, the last group from the day was called in to see the president. This BMI cadet tagged along with the <coughs> last group. The White House attendant looked at him very sternly, but the cadet didn't seem to be any threat to the president, so he let him go in. When the last group left the, the office of the president, there were just two people in the room, the president and this BMI cadet. History doesn't record exactly what they said, but I'll surmise to you it was very much this. The president said, yes, young man, what can I do for you? The young man said, I'm trying to become an army officer, but I can't get a seat for the examination. <clears throat> so the president likely said to him, do you have any recommendations? And the president and the cadet pulled off his letter and he said, Sir, you know, I have this letter. So when the president looked at the letter, if he wasn't sitting down, I presume he sat down. And he may have asked the cadet to tell him about VMI or about General Scott Ship, who had signed the letter. But I don't think the president asked, was listening much if he responded at all. And the reason was, the president that day was the last president who had been a Civil War veteran. And as luck would have it, the president had been in a unit, the same unit that on June 11th and 12th of 1864 had been at Lexington, Virginia. And when VMI was burned, his unit was there. There wasn't a thing this young VMI cadet could tell him about VMI or General Scott Ship or the Civil War because he knew far more than this cadet ever did. Well, the cadet, after the 10 minutes, left the president's office, and a short time afterward, he had a seat for the examination, which he took and he passed. And he passed it very well. <clears throat> Go ahead, Alec. And this is that young uh, uh, VMI cadet who sat for the examination. Now, the VMI cadet were very fortunate he did go to see the president without an invitation because this is the man he became. Uh, you know him today as General George C. Marshall. So um, if Marshall hadn't become a second lieutenant, he would never become chief of staff of the Army during World War II. Essentially during the war, he was um, the boss for Eisenhower and MacArthur. He served at the president's side. And uh, this is a photograph of Marshall uh, in World War II late in the war uh, being briefed by a division commander on a, on a sand, sand table about the, the battle plan. The officers uh, who are standing around, they're VMI officers. Tom Handy, you can see part of his face uh, on the left side. Thomas Handy was the deputy chief of staff of the Army. You can also see George Patton, who was VMI class of 1907, went to VMI one year. And the man in the, in the, in the waistcoat, um, that is um, General Walton Walker, who was VMI class of 1909. Uh, his son went to VMI for a year, as, to, as did Walker. And um, Walton Walker uh, commanded the Armored Corps under Jackson, uh, under Patton in the Third Army. And Walton Walker was the most senior American officer who died in the Korean War a few years after the war. Uh, to each other, they were Ike and Brad, but Marshall was always sir to them. And the cadet you saw uh, early in the photograph, in the picture of the uh, Saturday Evening Post, this is that cadet returning to VMI many years later uh, for a, a class reunion. And at VMI, before the reunions, plaques go up for the alumni um, killed in different battles. And you'll see more plaques always going around the Institute. And then the visitors come to the Institute. Uh, the haberdasher from Missouri, uh, the Jayhawk and his wife from Kansas, uh, the rancher from Texas, uh, the football player from Michigan, uh, the peanut farmer from Georgia, engineer, uh, the baseball owner from Houston. So the visitors come to the Institute. And they come to the Institute uh, to honor not only, to not only see the cadets, but the, to honor the contributions by the alumni before them. And so whether it's from, um, whether it's from the Marne to the Meuse Argonne, from Bataan to Iwo Jima, from Heartbreak Ridge to Quezon, from Fallujah to Afghanistan, uh, from the Ardennes to Okinawa, from Normandy to New Guinea, or from Italy to North Africa. These are the walls uh, where you'll see VMI Civil War legacy. Thank you very much. Uh, real quick, I think I neglected to mention that
even mention the name of that president that Marshall had to deal with, and what happened to him shortly thereafter. Oh, thank you, Jim. Um, I was paying attention. He was paying. The president that he had to, <clears throat> that he met with uh, in, the, in September of that year went to Buffalo, New York, and there, on in early September, uh, the president was at the Temple of Music when a young man came up to see him and uh, with a handkerchief covering his hand, and he fired two rounds into his stomach. Eight days later, the president died. That was William McKinley. So figure the odds of that. Buffalo, New York, and Buffalo, New York the other way. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the that. Yeah, the ironies. Yeah, the, ir the ironies of history, as uh, anybody who studies history knows, you don't need a lot of fiction. The truth is sometimes stranger than anything you could find in fiction. Thank you. Yes, sir. Why did you go to yeah, my, wow, okay. Oh, <laughs> good question. Um, when I was a kid, we went to Washington on a family vacation. And on the way back, Dad drove us past to Washington College, Washington Lee, and we saw VMI as well. And as a, as a young boy with a young sister, <clears throat> um, this looked like an ideal place because they had cannons and swords and statues, but they had gates with guards. And there was no way your mom and dad or your little sister could come in your room and bother your stuff <laughs> in my era. So I thought this place looks absolutely perfect. I can't imagine a nicer place to go <laughs> as a kid. So I just, I, I like that and I like the history because I knew the history was um, what I was going to major in at VMI and study. And I had a wonderful time as history major at VMI. Um, sorry I became a lawyer, but that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that just kind of went that way. Oh, yeah, I, I just, uh, there were no Union generals. There was one. There was? There was oh, one. Yeah, there was one general. Who was that? He was, he was in a Washington, D.C. militia. I may have his name here. If I don't, I can get it to you. But it wasn't a, it wasn't a field. He wasn't in the, well, not in the field. He was doing something in Washington, D.C. There was a Union colonel named uh, Charles Denby. He commanded, I think it was the 38th or 42nd Indiana at Perryville. And he was wounded there. He comes back, and I think he commands the 80th Indiana after that. Um, so you do have some folks um, in the Union. When you saw the number of the, of the uh, casualties they had there in June of 1863, 40%, that did not include any of the VMI graduates who were in the Army of Mississippi who were besieged at Vicksburg because they couldn't get that information. And it also didn't include any of the Union uh, graduates from VMI because obviously that information is not coming south. So. Um, they didn't know, but uh, there are a few. Uh, it's one of the parts of the Civil War folks forget that folks have family on both sides. So that was the same situation for VMI. Where were the historical records from VMI that moved to in 1864 when it was under attack? They were, they were taken out and they went to was Balcony Falls, someplace very close. And the Cadet Corps moved to Richmond. They went to the Alms House in Richmond um, I would expect the records were kept there in the almshouse during the, during the Civil War. The person to ask that good question to is either Kip, Keith Gibson or Diane Jacob. My guess would be they were kept in the almshouse, but I don't know that. Well, and, and then I think getting back to the same question, we had Jackson. Uh, who, who else were major generals? There was a, um, ja Jackson was West Point, so we wouldn't count in here. Oh, okay. um, Robert Rhodes. Uh, who's a general at third? Um, right, yeah, Rhodes. Yeah, Rhodes, Rhodes is one. William Mahone is one. Mahone's one. And I want to say it was Payne, but I don't recall. I don't recall who the third one was exactly. I want to say it was Payne, um, uh, but I'd, I'd have to look that one up. I'd have to look that one up. Yeah. yeah I mean, the brigadiers were way too many. I'm not. Gonna... Yeah. Um, the the brigadiers. Um, one of them was interesting. Was um, was a man named uh, Henry Lane, who commanded the North Carolina Brigade that fired into Jackson when they were out there for the lines. Rec 26, 26, uh, 26 with the, the 26 North Carolina had a man named uh, uh, Henry K. Bergwin. He was 21 years old. He was called the Boy Colonel. He died there at Willoughby Run against the Iron Brigade when they were attacking there uh, across Willoughby Run. You know, the Wisconsin folks reminded me that they were the other side, yeah, so. Oh, yeah, those are yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't trust the Wisconsin folks, you know, from all my. Um, 
But uh, yeah, there's a, at the second day at Gettysburg, there's a young man named Henry, uh, named uh, Latimer, um, Latimer, and he commands the uh, Snowden's artillery battalion on, on Benner Hill, the smaller hill that the Confederate artillery is supporting their attack on Culp's Hill. So, and he's 17 years old, but he's got a whole battalion of artillery that he commands, about 20 guns. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, the w reason I mentioned Lane was, uh, of course, he was a brigadier there at Chancellorsville. He doesn't get promoted. And I'm sure there's a reason for that is probably because it was his folks who shot Jackson. <laughs> you know, that's, I can't, I imagine that, that inhibited his promotion. Another one who doesn't get promoted after brigadier is Gabriel Wharton. Um, I think it was Gary Gallagher who said that, um, Davis just had something against Gabriel Wharton. I don't know what it was, but, but there was something against Gabriel Wharton. He wasn't going to promote him, so he's a pretty good year. Thanks very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Right, thank you.